Tonight, I have the opportunity to talk to you about two of my favorite topics. One, being a woman of color. Two, politics. And they don't always go hand in hand. I think sometimes, well, they do now because of the show Scandal. But, <laughs> but before that, that wasn't always the case. And I have had the wonderful opportunity for the past four years to serve the president of the United States. I no longer do that. I left this past summer to take on another adventure. But for me, I want to talk to you a little bit tonight about my experience. One, about being a young woman of color in this country, and two, navigating politics doing that. So I grew up in Atlanta, Georgia. Now, my parents immigrated her here in the late 1960s, and they actually had no idea about the civil rights movement. So yes, they didn't know about the bombings, they didn't know about the boycotts, they didn't know about Martin Luther King, bridges, nothing. So they came here and immediately thought, wow, what did we do? <laughs> Fortunately, though, my parents were two very strong individuals, particularly my mother. So she figured out very quickly, I'm going to have to teach these kids confidence, and I'm going to have to teach them willpower. So every day, as we got ready to go to school, we walked out the door, she'd be like, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> Remember, be independent and cultivate a strong backbone. Now, cultivate to a 10-year-old is like an extracurricular word. <laughs> I had no idea what she was talking about. So I'd come home exasperated about something that happened, and she'd be like, well, what, what is your backbone? I don't know what it is. <laughs> Do you know what it is? Because I don't know what it is. So over and over again, my mom would always say this. Even when I was getting ready to go off to college, she's like, by now, your backbone should be way strong. <laughs> way strong. What is this woman talking about? <laughs> but believe it or not, it was actually very good advice. As I started going to college and as I worked my first job, I faced a lot of challenges. One of the challenges was a little unique and one that I didn't expect. But even looking at me now, you may not know how old I am. But I have a tendency to kind of lean to looking young. So quite often, a lot of times, people would think that I was a teenager or they would think I was a child. And even to the point where one time I was getting ready to go to Atlanta, a flight attendant comes home really frantically. She says, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, ma'am. She's like, I hate to break it to you, but you know what? She's like, we're gonna have to ask you to leave the exit row. And I said, why? She's like, because we don't allow anybody under 18 to fly on the exit row. I was like, ma'am, I'm 27. I can fly on the exit row. So as you can imagine, or believe it or not, this started to impact my psyche. So I joined the Obama campaign right around that time, and I was working for someone. And the entire time, I never thought I could do his job because I thought he was way older, way more experienced. Come to find out, I'm reading in the paper one day, I'm actually two years older than him. <laughs> so it was around that time that I started to think, you know what, you got to get over this. You really have to start doing what you like to do. And I love politics. I love the races. I listened to all the shows. I started leading political engagement roundtables around the country, everywhere from Brownsville, Texas, to Tampa, Florida. It was really something I thrived on. So I thought to myself, I got to take the advice that everyone says, and I need to really start stepping into this, maybe using some backbone. So believe it or not, I ended up moving to Washington, DC after the election. And I joined the Obama administration, worked in the Department of Education, and met a lot of people that worked at the White House interviewed, got my job. So I'm so excited. I kept my job. I'm feeling good. I call my mom like, yeah, we working at the White House. Yes. See, I tell you the buck when I come through. <laughs> and I think to myself, OK, here she goes again. But what is actually really true was that she knew that I was going to need it. So they host a big dinner in Atlanta. I'm so excited. I get introduced. And come to find out at the end of the dinner, one of their leaders walks up to me and he says, you know, it's so good that they actually do this. This is a big job. You know, you're going to be liaisoning with the president. You're going to be talking to people on behalf of him. He was like, I mean, because you look so young. How is anybody going to take you seriously? And this is even before I walked into the gates of the White House. <laughs> so as you can imagine, I literally started carrying this. And even though I didn't think I was, I was carrying it in the way that I approached work. I was carrying it in the way that I spoke. I was carrying it all the time, thinking to myself, I don't know if I can do this. So one day, my chief of staff, he comes in. He says, you know what, Heather, you're great. 
I was like, really? He's like, no, you're great. You're organized, you're thorough. You put together great meetings. You have fantastic ideas. He's like, you just ran a 150 person conference and you introduced the president. You're fantastic. And he's like, I just need you to put a little bit more gut into this. And I was like, what do you mean? Like more backbone? He's like, <laughs> yeah, look around. And he was right. Looking around the White House, I saw all of these women of color who were running things. We had Tina Chen. She was the chief of staff to the first lady and executive director on the White House Council on Women and Girls. That's two jobs. You had Cecilia Munoz. She was domestic policy director, leading the president's policy agenda for years. And then there was my boss, senior advisor to the president, Valerie Jarrett. She was running engagement from local elected officials to CEOs of Fortune 500 companies. So I started watching them. These women did not back down. They knew how to talk in front of audiences. And yes, they had years of experience, but they also instilled in all of us that you can do it as well. And that's what I started to learn, is that I could be a leader. I could do this. I could organize meetings. I could brief the president. I could organize you know, some tragic events to some triumphant events. And so it was an amazing experience for me. But it leads me back a lot of times to the question. I looked at how some of my colleagues treated me. You know, sometimes to come to find out, oh, you're the one in charge? Yes. Oh, you're the one that's gonna be here to speak? Yes. <laughs> It'd be amazing to me. And a lot of times I had to use that same backbone. But I also, I challenge us tonight to really start thinking, how do we see our leaders in our society? How do we really see women as leaders? If you ask yourself, when I say, who is the head of an oncology for a major hospital, do you think it's a woman? When you really think about who's the head of transportation, are you thinking of a woman? And now, we're even in a day and age where we might have a woman president. And when you look at the, the plethora of governors and mayors, a lot of times it's just not women. So I think we really have to start thinking about this. We really have to change our mindset on how we view women as leaders. Men, I challenge you, if your boss is a woman, how do you react to her? How do you think about her? And as women, how do we treat other women as leaders? Do you actually call your friend to tell her about a job that may even be better than yours that's a leadership position? Or do you just call and give her advice? A lot of times, I don't think we want to embrace leadership because it does take backbone. It does take hard conversations, but it can be done. And we're gonna get a place to our society where we have women leaders and we have women leaders of color. So I think we're at a prime time to really get ready for it. You know, there were a lot of goodbye celebrations at the White House. It was very sad for me to leave, but it was an amazing experience and the time was over. And at one of the celebrations, one of the most senior leaders of the community, he came up to me and he said, uh, Heather, you know, I don't know what we're gonna do without you. And I was like, no, no, no. He was like, no, 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 you don't understand. He was like, you know, we called you the general. <laughs> and the funny thing is, is that I never saw myself as a general. When you think of a general, do you really think of a five foot three Caribbean American woman from Atlanta, Georgia? Probably not. But I think it's time that we change our perceptions so we can have a whole new generation of leaders. Good night.